Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar Metadata for Research Data. Um, the webinar is part of the series Research Data Management uh, in Austria, which is a series we started in uh, 2020. Uh, and it is uh, a series of workshops and webinars where we try to provide researchers and research support staff with relevant information regarding various aspects of research data management and digital preservation. And we discuss topics such as writing a data management plan. As I mentioned, uh, we are recording the, our today's event and we will provide the slides and the recordings in the repository uh, FEDRA, which is the institutional repository of the University of Vienna. And you can also uh, watch any uh, of our webinars that you might have missed uh, on our YouTube channel. So uh, right to the beginning, I can let you know about our next event, which is uh, going to be called Fair Research Infrastructure at Institutions, uh, with, uh, conducted by our colleagues at the University of Innsbruck, which will take place on February 22nd. And you can still register on our project website, but I do have to let you know that this event will be uh, held in German. We look forward to seeing you there. But let's now have a look at what we have prepared for you today. Uh, so uh, our first talk will be by Jenny Ostrop, who will be covering, uh, giving you some, some tips and strategies for finding and reusing research data. Then we have Christoph Ladona, who will uh, give you uh, some advice on describing uh, your data. We will then have a, a Q&A session where you can uh, ask our first two speakers uh, all your questions. Feel free to use the chat uh, during their talks. We will be collecting those questions, uh, but again, we won't be recording that part of the session. So you can also unmute yourself and just ask your questions directly. So after uh, this part, we have the, our third talk of the day, uh, which will be uh, done by Elena first and myself on um, the topic of metadata documentation and uh, data management plans. So let me introduce our speakers. Um, uh, Jenny Ostrop is a senior academic librarian at the University of Bergen in Norway. She has a background in life science research and she's part of the library research data team where she delivers training courses and provides guidance on information literacy on open science topics and also research data management. Uh, our second talk will be uh, Christoph Ladona from the Graz University of Technology, who has been responsible for the institutional repository at the university for the past 10 years. And he's also very active in various international and national projects, such as uh, uh, Invenia RDM, which is about developing uh, open source software for repositories, uh, also Fair Data Austria and the Open Education Austria Advanced Project. Uh, Elena first is uh, a colleague of mine from the University of Vienna who works as a project manager for Fair Data Austria, where she develops uh, RDM training courses. And she's also part of another digitization project called Resynergy, where she is involved in implementing standardized data interfaces. And my name is Teresa Kalova. I also work as a project manager for Fair Data Austria at the Vienna University Library and I uh, design training courses on research data management. And I also develop a certificate course for data stewards. So let's jump right into our uh, today's topic. What is metadata for research data? Let's have a look at this uh, quotation by a scientist uh, from Austrian University who works in uh, the life sciences. When you have a data file, you need to somehow understand months and years later what this data file is about. And the metadata is the context that allows you to understand the file. So basically you have your data and then you have all that context information that you need to understand this this information to understand this data, which is something that uh, is helpful to yourself, 
I think we all know the case when we've done a research project and then years uh, or even just months later, we didn't really understand our own data. We didn't know what we have done, when we have done it and how exactly to understand this uh, data. Uh, but it also can be very helpful in making your data findable and reusable to other researchers. So uh, now I will uh, give the floor uh, to Jenny, who will tell you more about uh, the topic of findability and reusability of research data. Jenny, go Thank ahead. You. Thank you so much. I will try to share my screen. I hope you can see my screen now and hear me all right. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me um, to open this interesting webinar today with a short presentation about how you can find and reuse research data. So um, basically approaching the metadata topic from the other side. My name is Jenny Ostrop and I work at the library at the University of Bergen on the west coast of Norway. And don't worry about taking notes. Uh, this presentation is available both on Zenodo and on FIDRA, as Teresa already pointed out. If you describe research data management in the course of a research project, we often use the term research data lifecycle that goes from planning a project over collecting data, analyzing data, until you publish the corresponding results and hopefully also your data. And in the collection and capturing step, you can either generate novel data for a research project, or you can reuse existing data sets, so-called secondary data. And here on this picture, you see Maybrit and Edward Moser, the Norwegian Nobel Prize winners in 2014, who uh, found the grid cells that help you to um, have an internal coordinate system to orient in space. And they said that our intention is to make all raw data from all published studies available. The data contain a lot more interesting information than what has been published and we encourage users to dig further. And this is a very important reason to reuse data because most data sets contain much more information than that was followed up in the connecting research publications. In addition, reusing data allows you to apply new questions or angles to publish data sets. It allows you to work with data that you would not have the resources or infrastructure or expertise to create. And importantly, it also allows you to integrate data from different studies, from different labs, or even from different disciplines. And thereby it allows you to enter new avenues of research. And reusing data is also resource efficient, that's why research funding bodies um, really like the concept. So if you have found a data set that you would like to reuse, how can you credit the authors? How can you cite the data set? The simple principle is attribution and access. You can find more information, for example, in the joint declaration of data citation principles. So this work, how you should cite data, corresponding citation styles is still ongoing. Um, or Creative Commons has an easy to remember acronym, TASL for title of the data set, authors of the data set, source where you can access the data set, and the license of the data. And often you don't really have to worry about how you can cite the data set because many archives contain information how the data set should be cited. Here's an example from Dataverse and O, which is our institutional archive. Now, if you want to find data sets for your research question, um, the first step is that you need to discover suitable data sets. You need to be able to access and download the data. And here it's important at what scale you're operating. Are you interested in one particular data set and you're going to download it manually? Will you write a script to download a couple of data sets? Or are you interested in downloading a large number of data sets using an automated programming interface. 
And of course, you have to understand the data. And one issue here can be that human readability and machine readability, both of the data files and the metadata is not always the same. And finally, you need permission to build upon the data. And you can translate these requirements um, to the single letters in the FAIR guiding principles. Data needs to be findable. That means it should be accompanied by rich metadata, and the data set should have a persistent identifier. Data is accessible when you can find it in a trusted research data repository. And in case of controlled access, the access criteria need to be clearly defined. And in order to be understandable, interoperability is a really useful concept. That means you can um, you, you follow standards, metadata schemes, also standards for the file formats. And it's important that you avoid ambiguity. And that can be achieved, for example, by cross-referencing between data sets and by using, for example, controlled vocabularies and ontologies so that it's clearly defined what is actually meant. And finally, data is reusable when it has a license that tells you clearly what you're allowed to do and not to do when you build upon the data. And it's very important to point out here that fair data and open data is not necessarily the same, although we would like data to be open and fair whenever possible. Scientific data sets are often data underlying a scientific article, but it can also be data sets that are not connected to a publication. For example, a data set of negative data that was difficult to publish the traditional way. And then it becomes more and more common that there is micro publications or publications in data journals that describe a data set in more detail. And all of them you should hopefully find in research data repositories. There is three types of research data repositories. First, we have the community repositories that are discipline specific. Examples here are for the EM EMBL EDI repositories, um, Clarine for language data, for example. Then we have institutional repositories. For us at the University of Bergen, that's ULB Open Research Data based on the Dataverse infrastructure. And there is multidisciplinary or general purpose repositories such as, for example, Zenodo, Picture, or Drive. And you need to apply different strategies to find these data sets. So we have the data underlying a scientific article, we have data and relevant community archives, and we can conduct meta search for data sets across archives. So data underlying a scientific article, they are hopefully deposited in a data archive and not hidden away in the supplemental material. And always um, you should be able to find the reference, a persistent identifier for the data set in the article. Often that is a digital object identifier, DOI, but it can also be an identifier, um, another identifier, for example, one that resolves via identifiers.org or a persistent URL. Via the identifier, you are able to access the landing page in the data repository. And this landing page refers you to the actual data set that you can access and download. This is an example from an article on host factors for SARS-CoV-2 that was published in Cell last year. And here in the STAR methods, there is a section that's called data and code availability. And it states that the sequencing data from CRISPR knockout screens reported in this paper is published in EMBL EBI Array Express under a given accession number. So I can go to Array Express, enter the accession number, and find the data set. And what can be very useful is that some literature search engines, such as here, Europe PubMed C, uh, European C link to the data. So um, because this data availability statements are relatively easy to find, 
they do text mining and extract the links to the data. You could also directly go to ArrayExpress if you're interested in sequencing data, for example, or in other relevant community archive. Um, the advantage here is that data in community archives has a uniform format and uniform metadata schemes. They follow discipline-specific standards, so they contain the information that's most likely relevant for you. And sometimes they're curated, which improves the quality of the data. And if you want to identify relevant community archives, the first question is, where do researchers in your field publish their data? But you can also have a look at curated registries of data repositories. Um, and here, the most important ones are refreedata.org, that's the most comprehensive repository. And an alternative is fairsharing.org. Um, that has some nice filter functions that you can apply. And also your research libraries can often help you with searching for suitable repositories. And finally, you can do meta search across data repositories. There's a number of data meta search engines and they're very useful if you want to search across disciplines, if you want to identify data in institutional archives, perhaps of institutions you have never heard of before, or if you want to find data in multidisciplinary archives, such as Zenodo. And here it's important to keep in mind that the repository coverage varies, and it becomes evident that the metadata quality is critical because it's the metadata that is indexed and allows you to search for a data set. We have five main actors here. The non-commercial ones are data site, which is also a large fabrica for DOIs. We have BASE from the University of Bielefeld, and we have open air that's financed by the European Commission. And we also have two commercial actors, Mendeley Data and Google Dataset Search. And I would like to make you aware that if you do meta search for datasets, not every search result will be a real dataset, which often leads to confusion. And this is because some journals deposit article tables or also sometimes figures as a data set to usually its um, general purpose archives such as Figshare or Dryad. And finally, I would like to take you a bit into the future because there is the vision of creating the European Open Science Cloud, which should be a one-stop shop for all types of digital research artifacts, including data sets, documents, algorithms, also tools and workflows. Um, and the aim is to make them as fair as possible across all European research infrastructures. So the concept is an umbrella for existing research data archives and other types of archives. And it has been said that the core data infrastructure should be in place 2024-2025, just to give you an outlook how the landscape might look in a few years. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions, I guess, after Christoph's talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for uh, the really uh, interesting talk. Uh, do feel free to uh, ask questions if you have any for Jenny in the chat uh, or just wait for the Q&A session after uh, our next talk. But before we go uh, to Christoph's talk, uh, we have a very short survey for you. Just to find out a little bit about your experience with repositories. Have you ever published research data in a data archive or a, or a repository?
I'm going to give you a few more seconds if you want to answer the question. There we go. So uh, this is a pretty clear statement of uh, around 17, we have 71% of people who have answered a no, you have never published research data in a data archive for a repository, but we still have 29% who have experience uh, with a data archive or a repository, which is perfect because uh, it's a perfect time for uh, Christoph's talk on um, how metadata and documentation play a part in, when you publish uh, research data in a repository. Christoph, go ahead. Okay, hello, my name is Christoph. Uh, I start with sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, now I will talk a little bit about metadata. I want to start with some uh, historical background. Uh, what's the what's the reason why metadata was invented, or what's the the, the reason behind that? It's uh, the libraries in the past went uh, bigger and bigger, and it was difficult to locate the physical book or the physical items uh, inside of a library. Also, the content uh, went bigger and bigger, so it was difficult to know or to keep an overview of what's inside of the uh, of the library. So smart people um, had the idea to to put some to, to describe uh, the books and the items which are in the library with uh, catalog cards. So there are small or uh, short um, things there. There are titles, authors, and some other informations. And to locate the data or the to locate the, the books, it was necessary to put some numbers there. And with that number, it was possible to find the data, uh, the, uh, the book inside of the, of the library. The, the catalog cards or the catalogs are then sorted by author or by title. Uh, the, in the sense of there are two uh, catalogs, one with author, uh, author, one with title. Uh, and if you search there, then you find uh, the catalog card, then you know where to find uh, the book inside of the library. Now we want to jump into the present. Uh, we have still publications. We have still the same problems uh, to locate. There are much more uh, publications as in the past. Uh, and we still use the same solution for publications. And now we want to use the same system for research data. So in a sense, we want to describe our data uh, with metadata. Uh, what's the real minimum of metadata? The real minimum of metadata would be to describe your data with a title and to, and to, to put the authors there. But as you think that's not really enough, so what's, what, should be, uh, what should be more? So we should think about the content. Uh, if we want to find uh, our, our, um, our records or our data, then we have to, to describe it with a little bit more. So we, we want to define our, con uh, we want to, to describe the content. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if uh, the, the, the purpose of metadata is to have one thing to first to, to find your data and the second thing to, to cite or to use afterwards. So if you want to, if you keep in mind you that other persons want to find your data, then you have to describe as, as detailed as possible. Uh, and it's no, and the other person I said that other persons want to search or to find your data, maybe also yourself want to find your data afterwards or to know what what your data is about. Maybe you forgot in a year or two, um, could be possible. Uh, and then you could refine your data with with, the, with a good description. So what's the, the, the content metadata would be classification, publication date, uh, related work. So related work to put it in a, in a broader context to have an abstract, to know in short sentences what what's the data is about, uh, resource type, um, publisher, language, 
and so on. There are a lot of uh, metadata fields to describe the content. Um, and now we're jumping a little bit into the repository. Uh, a repository should help you in some ways to describe your data. And in, in it's there are some things that is technically possible and some helps or some some fields there's not really a, um, not yet possible to help you from a technical side of view. What I mean here is with not yet possible, uh, I mean to to find the right title, to find the right abstract, to to classify your data. Um, I know that there is some some research going on to to describe um, your data, to describe or to summarize uh, um, publications automatically. Um, there is some progress on it, but not yet that um, useful. I think for the for the real um, for the re for your real work to describe your data. So you should use your skills to to find the title, to to find an abstract, to find the classifications. Uh, then we have uh, technical help. Well, technical help uh, is possible. There we are in the sense of to to validate some input data like for publication date or for languages um, in the sense of that that the data which you are filling in into the, the form of a repository should always look uh, the same. So for, publica for publication date, it should have like the form day, month, year, and, should, and it should be always the same that, that there is no miss, that is not possible to misinterpret your your string or your your date because otherwise other persons other other time zones on other countries would uh, write year month day other would write uh, month day year and if you are not clear uh, of the schema which you are using in the repository and if you would not validate your data when you input the, the the thing into the repository or the, the repository, not you as the as a researcher, but the repository would not validate the data. It could be uh, misinterpreted and that's not a good thing. Um, uh, the language, there could be some possible help. Uh, I think not that that's such a feature is implemented in the repository, but, but it would be fine. Uh, in the sense of we all know uh, that some translation software uh, could detect the language which uh, you are using. So it could be a feature for a repository. And now we are going into the classification. The classification here, what I mean is not in the sense of to find the, the right um, classification, but to have controlled vocabularies. Controlled vocabularies um, should be used a lot uh, on, your, on your metadata uh, because it it helps you as the person who is entering the data and the person who is finding or searching your data. In the sense of uh, controlled, vocal controlled vocabulary is, is of the idea you have a key value pair. Uh, the key would be uh, some words or phrases, but short really one, two uh, words put together and they map to a clear defined meaning. So you have for those words a clear definition uh, what those words mean in the context of, of your um, controlled vocabulary. This um, helps you as a researcher to describe your data. So you can go through the controlled vocabulary, find out what words will describe your data as, as detailed or as, as perfectly as possible. And then you could use that. And in the other way around, if you think of the person who is searching your data, who wants to find data uh, which um, fits into their uh, need, and they could use then the words um, and the controlled vocabulary and then find your data. So it's for you and for them, it's a good thing. <clears throat> and controlled vocabularies are used in, in multiple um, parts of, of a repository. We have the resource type where it's clear uh, which resource we have. If we have in the sense of uh, a, a picture, uh, a data set and some other things, because it's 
it's uh, research data could be more than only you no, know, could be a lot of of different things. So you could have clear defined um, words. Then affiliation. Affiliation is also it goes affiliation goes in in the direction that um, all all what is um, I would say that um, that. The, the the dual affiliation is not 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 written in different ways so that your say university has always the same uh, words so it could be uh, it's easier to to create facets to to filter uh, about your institution and so on so and then we have as i thought uh, as i um, said before the classifications and the licenses the license is also a good thing that it's all always written the same. Um, as an example, uh, I put also the license on, on my slides on the right bottom. So if you see that, <coughs> you know what uh, what's what's the license of my of my um, slides, and you don't have. Oh, so if you see it the first time, then you have to look up, but it's clearly defined somewhere, public uh, available. Uh, and if you see it uh, not the first time, then you know um, then you know what you what you have to do. You know what what's there. And if you have licenses and licenses which are uh, which a, a person freely uh, use, then it's it's not a good thing that because you have to look up, you have to to find what's really there, and that's more work. So you you as a researcher put more work on the on the person who is using your data, uh, or who finds your data, and I think that's not a good usability. Uh, so we have different classifications, like as an example, the DDC, Ofos, Ofos would be for more for um, Austria. Uh, that's a classification schema to to classify your 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 publications, but it's also um, it could be used also for search research data, and the MIME type. The MIME type would be to to describe really what's uh, what's your data set, what's the data, uh, what's the file of your data set, and the idea behind that is to give also a little bit of a hint how to to use your data what what software is necessary or what environment is necessary to use your data afterwards and i talked a lot about use so there is also automated data uh, like licenses and doi um, jenny also talked a bit about doi doi is uh, i should I have should write not DI but permanent identifier there uh, because permanent normally I think it's the DI um, and the digital object identifier which is used to have a permanent identifier for your data. Normally also a repository provides that uh, and it's helpful to, to cite your data um, and also for, for you to to give out um, where your data um, where your data is stored, and it's easier to find. And in the end, uh, I want to say some some words uh, about the form. So don't be afraid to fill out the form. Uh, it's it's it should be it should it should have a good usability. That's not always the case, but uh, it helps to to have beforehand an idea what you what uh, metadata um, or what what's really what what describes your your data as best as possible so please uh, please don't try to find uh, the best description before you, uh, when you're sitting for the form because then as i know from for myself it's sometimes not uh, that easy because you then have the um, right page, possible the right page problem, uh, and but uh, the form should not be should not so you should not be afraid of that, and uh, take advantage of the, uh, the the technical support. So what's there the the validation, the validation should help you. For me, it's always a good thing if the data is validated because before I save the data, because then I see uh, that 
on on a technical level um the the metadata is correct and and this as i thought uh, uh, it it improves the the usability uh, the, the usage um, the possible usage of your data and the, the my last words more or less uh, the use your publication skills i think that most of the researchers are used to to find a title for their uh, publication in public uh, research data is more or less the same uh, you have to find you have to to describe uh, your research data or your data sets with a title with an abstract so use your publication skills and i think then you are good to go and thank you thank you so much christoph for all the very uh, practical tips about what it means to create metadata in a repository um, there are several topics that Christoph mentioned, especially uh, persistent identifiers and licenses, where we are planning uh, webinars specifically on these subjects, which uh, will take place uh, sometime in the summer semester. So, something to look forward to. And uh, we'll give the word to Elena. You can share your screen now. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Teresa. So you should be able to see my slides now. So welcome to the last section of our webinar where we will take a look at the topic metadata and data management plans. Let's start with data management plans in general. What are they and why are they important? DMPs are essentially documents that are created using templates, checklists, a number of questions, or even software tools. And they are living documents, which means that they uh, can be updated or can be changed during um, your research project. On the right, you see an illustration of the research data lifecycle, which we have seen today already. And um, the DMP is a tool that helps you um, document and manage your research data uh, during the whole research data lifecycle. So starting with data collection through data analysis, and then thinking about how you want to publish your research data and data access. Why do we need DMPs? They are not just a requirement for funding, but they are actually uh, a tool that help you plan and organize data collection and analysis. And they are also essential um, to prevent data loss and to facilitate access and reuse of research data according to the FAIR principles. Now let's circle back to our topic metadata. We have already heard that um, metadata is essential for finding and reusing research data, and it's also necessary to be able, metadata is necessary to be able to, to upload or store your research data in repositories and data archives. So it only makes sense that uh, metadata also are um, a topic in data management plans and there are usually questions posed such as what metadata and documentation will accompany the data of your research project the answers um, that can be given to this question uh, include information about data organization the metadata standards that you're going to use or are using in your research project also the naming conventions and uh, how you organize your data in folder structures and so on. But uh, this information is rather abstract, why, which is why we decided to um, move our webinar to a hands-on session um, and look at an actual example of a data management plan from the research project EFRI Alliance. 
Free Alliance is an Horizon 2020 infrastructure project that uh, brings together African and European stakeholders. And the data collection includes surveys, interviews, inventories, and um, other uh, types of data collection and data types. Um, and uh, before we move to the collaboration part where we will use a Google document, I will brief briefly introduce uh, this hands-on session. Um, we are going to look at the question what metadata and documentation will accompany the data in the EFRI Alliance data management plan. And we will discuss the answers in this DMP which are five paragraphs in breakout rooms. We will post the chat to the Google document in just a few seconds, and uh, we will have a look at it later. You can um, use the comment section and the comment function in the Google document to engage with the text during the discussion in the breakout room and uh, post your suggestions, questions, critical remarks, and so on. Um, I will now stop sharing my slides and actually introduce you to the Google document. I think the link is already, I see you're coming in to the document, so the link is already um, in the chat. On the first page of our Google document, uh, you find a box with information about the project that I have just given to you, but uh, in more detail, and also a more detailed description of the data from the research project. The second box includes the instructions on how to use the Google document, and also some questions that we encourage you to think about while discussing the paragraphs and also while posting your comments and while reading the texts. In your opinion, which topics are covered well in the DMP? Which information provided do you consider the most important? What information is missing? And what would you add to the description? On the second page of the Google document, you find the question, what metadata and documentation will accompany the data? And also the answers from the EFRI Alliance um, DMP in five paragraphs. We will open the breakout rooms in just a few seconds. Um, we invite you to read one or more paragraphs and then discuss them in the breakout room. And we also invite you to use the comment function on the right here, or also post your comments right into the text. At the very end of the Google document, you also find a last question. In your opinion, does the information provided answer the question sufficiently? And you can answer this question during the breakout session or at the end of the breakout session. We will meet again uh, in the main session at quarter past 11, where we will take a look at your comments and discuss them together. Okay, I will now uh, open the breakout rooms. Uh, we won't, obviously won't be recording the breakout rooms just to make sure so you can feel free to switch on your camera and, and discuss uh, the topic with your colleagues. and I will share a last few information with you. Right, so some of you may feel now like you have been thrown in at the deep end by having to analyze a real data management plan uh, 
But in the famous words of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. There is help and support available. Most research institutions do offer uh, support services on uh, metadata, on research data management in general. You can find them at usually at the uh, library or uh, support re other research support services, maybe even the IT department. So do have a look at your own institution. I'm sure you will find uh, people who can who can help you create metadata and documentation for your data and help you find solutions that work best for you. Uh, but if you don't have that help available, but even if you do, there is really a large plethora of resources available online. Most of them are really freely available. There is a, a whole a huge number of, of examples of data management plans like the one we've used today. Uh, but there are also templates and guides on how to create a data management plan, how to document your data in various disciplines, how to create metadata and how to upload your data to a repository. All that information is out there. So do, uh, do have a, a little look and find something that helps you. And we will also provide uh, several helpful links and resources in our follow-up email, such as the link to uh, the example of the DMP we've used today and uh, to a collection of more than 800 uh, examples of uh, data management plans from European projects. So uh, that's all from us for today. I thank you very much for, for joining us, for listening in and asking such uh, wonderful, interesting questions. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, Elena, Jenny, and Christoph for the really, uh, really interesting tips and uh, the, um, the talks that you've given today. And again, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I do wish you a very, very nice day. And we hope to see you at one of our next webinars. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.